I'm gonna come on, take up space for a bit. <laughs> take over. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to have you all here, and uh, we're about to start the event, and we're gonna initially get some opening remarks from Natalia before taking it uh, to the panel. But it's really lovely to see you all here today. Thank you. You want to start? Okay, um, maybe Ashley should uh, start first, and then Natalia. Uh. Hi, I'm sorry, were you turning it over to me? I, my agenda had someone else before me, but I'm happy to start if you'd like me to. Yeah, uh, you can totally start, and then we'll kind of uh, follow your lead. Okay, terrific. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Natalie Roisman. I'm the executive director of the Georgetown Law Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. I'm really delighted to be joining you virtually from the campus of Georgetown Law in Washington, D.C. We are so excited to be partnering with Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society on this event and this project. Thank you so much for the opportunity to work together. Um, it's, of course, always wonderful to have an opportunity to collaborate across campuses and even better on a topic like this and with a purpose like this. We feel it's so important at the Tech Institute that we be part of fostering spaces where we can have conversations that really help to directly combat the risks of exacerbating inequalities and inequities across continents and even hemispheres as technologies like AI rapidly evolve. Um, I want to turn it over to the folks in the room, but I want to first note that this event is truly the epitome of how we at institutions can learn from our students. Um, here at the Tech Institute, we run the tech degree programs at Georgetown Law, which is our JD Tech Law Scholars Program and the Tech LLM Program. And while it is, of course, our job to train students, I always want to remember that we have no shortage of things to learn from them as well. So this event on the Georgetown end was the brainchild of a JD student fellow with our institute, and it was carried to fruition by one of our LLM students, and I couldn't be prouder about that. Um, I want to turn it over to Natalia, who's there in person, and uh, who can tell you more. Thank you so much for allowing us to be part of this, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Natalie, and thank you, everybody who is here. Um, seeing this live is just gonna make me happier. Having the opportunity to be here in person with you, it's also um, a really um, exciting experience. Um, my name is Natalia Larcón. I am originally from Colombia, so I am a foreign trained lawyer. And uh, I couldn't um, be more excited about the fact that we're finally dealing with uh, real conversations about Global North and the Global South joining together in um, topics such as AI governance. So just about some months ago, so in September uh, 2023, there was a cyber attack that basically shut down over 700 um, uh, between public and private owned um, companies in Colombia. So basically, um, not only in Colombia, also in Chile and Argentina. And this was uh, because a um, US based company was compromised and the entire uh, country was shut down for over two weeks. So um, things like this happened even without talking about the AI. So, it's gonna be, this conversation is really important to see who's gonna be empowered to just unplug everything. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here uh, with this esteemed group of panelists and uh, on this related topic that and so timely as we have been discussing. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the initial remarks and really setting up the stage for our panelists today. So as you will know, uh, my name is Bulalani Jilly, and I'm a PhD candidate here at Harvard and also a graduate fellow here at the Berkman Klein. And today I'm really 
uh, here to try and center the conversation around AI regulation in the context of the Global South with a particular attention to Africa. As much uh, of you uh, know, particularly if you're studying, say, technology studies or if you are studying development studies with a, an attention to AI, is that majority of the discourse is mediated by a form of descriptivism, which really means that we consistently are discussing, say, the Global South, and in particular Africa, in relation to the West. And while that you know, helps us understand uh, what interests the West might have in Africa, it doesn't really tell us much about what African stakeholders are doing. And so while this approach can give a mode of measurement, the measurement lacks a general attention to the nuances on the ground. And so this panel in many ways is really an attempt to get uh, Global South stakeholders and in particular people working on the ground to share a bit about some of their general insights. And so I'm very happy to have an amazing panel that includes Nanjira Sambuli, who's a, a researcher, a policy analyst, a strategist, uh, who really works at the intersections of technology and gender, who has done you know, multiple works with the Kenyan government and multiple stakeholders across the continent related to these topics, and is currently based in Nairobi, but is also a fellow with Carnegie Endowment. Uh, and then we also have Shiko uh, Gotu, who is an award-winning CEO, who also works in the general uh, vicinity of both AI regulation, but also is currently running an amazing AI company in Nairobi. And then we have also Dixon here, who is a technical advisor at the Security and Exchange Commission of the government of Ghana, and immediately uh, recently held the position of chief legal advisor to the Ministry of National Security, and is also an adjunct professor at Ghana School of Law. And so this is an amazing panel who can really give us both general observations, but primarily can also give us a great sense of what uh, African stakeholders are doing as relates to AI regulation. And so I will first love to invite uh, Shiko to kind of start us off. I know that they have recently published an amazing uh, white paper on AI regulation, particularly as it pertains to Kenya. And so I would first ask them to tell us a bit about some of the findings that they've made, but also to tell us a bit about what opportunities and challenges does AI governance pose for Kenya. You can't. Uh, uh, speaking to myself, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Vilani, uh, thank you. So uh, just to unbutcher my name, I'm um, Shiko Gitao. Uh, you see, I mean, yeah, Nanjela is laughing because that was quite a butcher. Um, so I'm Shiko Gitao. Uh, and um, as Bloni mentioned, I'm the CEO of Color. We are a digital innovation lab. We are headquartered in Nairobi and we cover all of Africa. Our goal is to catalyze Africa's digital future. Um, so it is interesting that I'm taking this call from Abuja in Nigeria and on the very Western part of Africa. And I'm here because the Nigerian uh, government is putting together its AI strategy and they have brought, brought together some of the top AI thinkers from the African continent or are linked to the African continent to just think through what will be an ideal AI strategy look like uh, for a country as huge as Nigeria. And I, I love what, what Nigeria represent themselves, they say, they're the largest uh, population of, of black people. And the second one is Brazil. And Brazil is almost a continent. I mean, Nigeria is almost a continent by itself, right? And I, I mean, I've been reflecting about this working um, this week in, on this strategy. I realized for us as Africa, um, AI is not a luxury. And that's where I'm going to start my, my, my input in. And in Kenya, I mean, when you when you're sitting in Nigeria and you're going all through these numbers of the Nigerian uh, country and you reflect on the countries that are the other countries, the smaller countries that we work with across Africa, you realize just how big an opportunity AI for us is. And I'll give an example. If you're sitting in Germany or New York, AI for you is an efficiency and productivity. Um, it, it increases your efficiency and productivity, right? 
And that's what you're looking at. It's going to increase my productivity. It's going to increase my efficiency. It's going to get me to get things faster. If you have like a doctor a doctor's appointment, if you have uh, you have to deliver your meals fast, if you have to send emails faster, it is a productivity and efficiency tool. For many of us sitting on the continent of Africa, uh, AI becomes an essential tool. And I'll give you an example. The whole of the African continent, all the 1.5 billion of us, have only 3,000 pathologists which means that you are likely to die before you get a diagnosis. With AI tool, and I'm going to use very simple AI tool, just simple visioning tool that is able to take your, your pictures and quickly diagnosis and give you a quick diagnosis. It is a matter of life and death. So while the US and Europe especially is arguing about 80% accuracy, 87%, 99.8% accuracy, as we have zero accuracy. So I'd rather have an 80% accuracy diagnosis than a 0, 0.5, I mean, than a 0% um, diagnosis at all. So that, that for me is the framing I want to take it from. Yeah? It is a matter of necessity more than a matter of efficiency to have AI as a widely, a widely used tool on Africa. So going back to our paper, and, uh, and going back to our paper, we looked, it, we, it was not just based on Kenya, it was based across Africa. We did our research looking at around, uh, around Africa. And we were arguing that if, if we are building this for necessity and for need, why should we be regulating? And that's the question we were asking ourselves. And our answer is we should not be regulating prematurely because what are we regulating? Are we regulating our 3000 pathologists and the opportunity to be able to scale them? So what do we need to put in place first before we regulate? The first part is data sets. There is no AI with, with no data. And there's data, and there's a paper that just came out maybe a couple of weeks ago that actually affirmed our initial hypothesis, our initial findings is that only 11% of the, or in, only 11% data has been contributed from Africa that is informing the, the, the current LLMs, right? Any of them, pick any random one, on 11% data from Africa. And that 11% is from Egypt not for the rest of the continent. I mean, it should have just picked Nigeria. It should have been quite representative, but no, it was just Egypt. And Egypt is not representative of the continent. So we need to have more representative data and data sets uh, that is informing AI for us to be able to speak about AI in Africa. But most importantly for Africa is our data system, which is a concept that we introduced on the paper. And why is this? That if you look at Africa, there are so many nuances that are not captured in the, uh, the English, and uh, in the English English language, as well as the English way of thinking, yeah? There's a way that English people think, or if you speak English as a primary language, the way you think about life and the lens that you look at life, which is very different. I always say that, for example, in Kenya, if you tell somebody, go straight, turn left, turn right, and then go straight, nobody will get that direction. Nobody, nobody, you'll just be losing people. Left, right, where is left? I have to lift my hand and see. What hand do I write with? Oh, that's right, right? That's what we do, right? Because we don't, that's not how we think. And the, the tribes that say, go north, then turn east, then turn west, yeah? Or some people will say, go straight. When you see this tree, turn on that tree. That's, that, that's data systems, right? But the other example I give is my son's name. My, my son's name is Kiama. Kiama has four different meanings. Yeah. So when, when you're writing an LLM and, I, and I'm saying I'm going to uh, to give Kiama uh, some candy, Kiama means different things. If I'm speaking in Swahili or my, my mother tongue, that means totally different things to different people. It might be my son's name, which means miracle. It might be a group of older men what? or a group or a group of people at all. And that is Kiama behind me, by the way. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, so for me, it is those data systems that needs to be put in place that capture our context on how we use our words, but also how we live. That's num that's data and data systems. Number two is working around um, our talent, and that's what I love about the work that we are doing right now in Nigeria is that we are looking at talent in the workforce, and you're not talking about ML engineers. 
we are looking at people who are collecting the data to prompt engineers, to ML engineers, to data, data engineers, all the way to the, somebody who's going to sit down and write a USSD driven app for the woman in the village who does not have a smartphone. We need to be thinking all through the value chain and start, start building a talent pipeline to support the AI ecosystem and AI economy. Number three is compute. We only have one single supercomputer on the continent of Africa, none in sub-Saharan Africa, because the one sits in uh, Morocco. There used to be one in South Africa, but it's not as powerful or as in use as it was, yeah? So yes, there are two. One is not great. The one that is actually great uh, is in Morocco. Uh, the other investments that are happening in the next three to four years that needs to, that that will help us. But that's where that's our reality right now. We need to put those things in place. We need to invest in compute to allow our researchers, our product people, our talent to be able to build AI. And finally, we need to to have a robust use case uh, directory. And this is the easiest one for us. Every time I speak to policymakers across the continent, they're always like, yeah, what is, will this AI do for me? And I've given you the one that I always, give, uh, the example I always give, there are only 3000 pathologists. What are you going to do with all the cancer diagnosis that you have on your country? We can use AI to reduce the time it takes for diagnosis, but also skill our, 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 our pathology. So that's what the paper looks like. The paper is looking at that. We call that the four horsemen model. And it's before you, before you start regulating uh, AI, do you have these four building blocks yeah, in place so, so that much. you can say so you can innovate on, I mean, you can innovate on top of that. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for those uh, opening remarks. So uh, Nigeria, I would love for you to kind of uh, pick uh, and start from that point and really try and help us understand how is Europe's leadership specifically in the space of uh, AI regulation then impacting things on the ground and how then should we see it both as a potential impediment to meeting some of the work that actually needs to be done uh, that was pointed out and also then uh, what then should we be uh, prioritizing if you know copying and pasting what Europe is doing is not meeting uh, the, the matters on the ground. And to be sure, I'll speak to Europe's normative roles uh, with respect to Africa. Um, by first prefacing by saying, you know, it's a present continuous relationship that is nowadays built as a partnership of equals, but uh, terms and conditions apply, I suppose. What we have been seeing is that uh, European Union, uh, through what they're calling the Team Europe banner, has been making interesting strides. Uh, you have uh, you know, actors like the German Development Agency, GIZ, with strong artificial intelligence programs that are going around uh, different African countries, helping shape AI strategies and policies. And actually, she could be curious if they have a presence in the Nigerian process. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> we, we see that. Uh, they have also been very strong in uh, shaping the African Union's sort of regulatory policy and regulatory departments and other instruments at the African Union level. Part of the incentive that the European Union has been pushing is to have an African Union single digital market that mirrors theirs. What that would do is give them numbers to bolster their sort of positioning in the great geopolitical spectrum. You have China and, and you know US on one side, but Europe tries to play at the normative superpower level, shaping the rules and regulations. So it would be an advantage to them to have another 1.5 billion market that has rules and regulations that follow that mirror theirs. The challenge with that is we have seen that uh, with the general data protection regulation, for instance, that has sort of become the catch-all phrase around the world for data protection laws that are being enacted, becoming more of a compliance mechanism to interact and to serve the European market, to trade in the European market, more so than it is about protecting our data sets or data uh, protection mechanisms locally. So even the institutional frameworks that are being set up, having borrowed GDPR-esque, uh, data protection laws tend to focus more on compliance with external actors more than supporting our data ecosystems. And that's problem number one, I think. Secondly, even if we were to say that there are some advantages that the European model would bring, say, in institutionalizing uh, regulations at a sort of continental level, 
the framework around which G the GDPR and other laws in Europe and regulations have come about focuses mostly on the individual rights. In Africa, unfortunately, the uh, whole concept of relationality that has now been left as a preserve of Hollywood with Ubuntu is really what should be driving what we do, the, the tension between individual and communal rights and duties. How do you balance that tension? We have these instruments right from the African Charter on Human and People's Rights that try to address these tensions about individual duty, uh, individual rights and collective responsibility, rights and duties that should have informed how we think about data sets. And to use some of Shiko's examples, when you're thinking about how these AI systems will be used, say, in turbocharging healthcare systems, you find that if a data set is being collected of a particular community or a particular group, it's not just about the individual who's being served by that model and the individual consent they're issuing. If they belong to a minoritized group in a different political economy, it has implications for what that means for them to be seen in the system that has often not seen them. So there's a lot of relationality aspects we're starting to lose in how we are complying with a GDPRS or European model-like approach to uh, setting rules and norms. And, you know, one interesting instrument, for example, right now with the African Union level is the African Union data policy framework that introduces a really cool concept of data justice that speaks to the whole process of thinking beyond individual rights to include collective needs and vulnerabilities, which is a strong essence of what we are, dis we are contending with in the political economies of Africa. So there's a serious tension there. And a lot of it obviously falls on how our African policymakers engage with local actors to understand how to take the best of what a European model has to offer, but make sure we are, we are sort of turbocharging it by what works for us. Because at this moment, we are the, you know, Africa is really Really where the, the source is at, so to speak, the, the next data sets are going to come from here. But it's not enough to just say we are aligning with West, to the rest, and the middle. We have to make sure whatever ends up being the normative or regulatory framework actually serves the needs of the African continent. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and so, uh, turning to you, Ose, uh, could you speak to the, uh, the same question and how is it potentially different from your vantage point, both as somebody who's working with and in the government, but also potentially uh, how exactly is US-China competition impacting, or if not at all, uh, your role and specific in the work on AI and governance? Okay. So it's a pleasure first to be here. I mean, at um, the Harvard Law uh, School, um, I just left here roughly about like 15 years ago. And so it's real pleasure coming back here. And um, the question that you've asked is a very similar one. I mean, the issue about um, European intrusion and um, European um, efforts to widen. I mean, uh, you just heard Nigeria say, I mean, widen the scope of action to the African market. One, let me just say this. I mean, expansionism per se. Okay. So that mirrors. Hello. So that mirrors uh, European expansionism. And expansionism per se um, can, first and foremost, let's get it right. I mean, it can be both positive and negative. So on the positive side, well, you might have, um, you might have cultural exchanges, you might have uh, views from elsewhere, markets, development, b b across both ways and stuff like that. But then what we're seeing, however, in places like Africa is something different. So um, we are more likely to see, because of the past, I mean, we're more likely to see um, European companies, the adoption of European approaches more than you, um, you would see the reverse of it. And that um, it's a very classic example of what will largely uh, typically occur. Um, if you pick, for example, the GDPR that um, Nigeria talks about, you would see a similar thing. I mean, you will see a lot of, um, so there's a lot of, I mean, Europe takes a lead ahead of the world in many, many areas. And that's something which is very characteristic of them on the positive side. And then also proselyze or evangelize the concepts to other parts of the world. I mean, that is something that has occurred throughout 16th century, 17th century, uh, 19th century, up to today, you know. And so, that will not see any, it won't, there won't be any reversals in that particular role. Then, um, but with that will also come the dominance of European companies, more or less in Africa. And so you would also see a local recession. I mean, that's it. Europe is a very powerful um, force. And there's more likely to be some recession from where I sit and I see 
more recession in terms of Afghan companies and their giant footsteps on the continent themselves. Uh -huh. And you made mention about America and then also um, China, yes. So uh, the, 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 the kind of competition that is unraveling between the United States and China is a very toxic one for a lot of the rest of the world. I don't know for America itself, but for the rest of the world, I think a lot of them, particularly the global south, for them, uh, there's a lot of toxicity to it. And when you pick, um, for several reasons, because the rest of the world um, is somehow clamoring for some of the things that China actually gives, and not some of the things that the United States or America gives. And uh, they are torn between a number of, um, they, are, they are torn in, in different ways. First, the competition also breeds um, itself. It breeds um, a, 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 a pregnant desire to, or pressurization of the African continent or countries to choose. I mean, you have to choose between America's God, the green mammon, for example, or the Chinese God, the red dragon. You have to choose one, you know. And if you look at the better part of Africa, I mean, you will see that a lot of choices have been going towards the Chinese way. In fact, the United States have been trying to persuade a lot of the countries in the world. If you pick, for example, um, during the Cold War, they would ask um, um, Brazil, they would ask Argentina, they would ask even Congo and all those kind of countries to turn their backs on the Soviet Union. I mean, but today, I mean, those same countries, I mean, have not, and they've done the opposite. Aside from that also, over 140 countries in the world have chosen BRI, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, precisely because it's, it's feeding two things. One is feeding infrastructural gaps that exist that Europe, neither Europe nor America is interested, apart from some of the expropriation that goes on, you know, um, uh, in many parts of the world. And the Chinese are capitalizing on those aspects also and building infrastructure across Africa. Whether it, you are talking about football stadiums or presidential palaces, or you are talking about, and that includes AI technology. America, for example, has been entering into I mean, agreements with African countries. If you pick America as one of its flagship um, 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 arrangements that it has with Afghan countries, the Security Governance Initiative, SGI, um, that's, and uh, pick countries like um, Kenya, Ghana, um, Tunisia, um, uh, Niger, and Nigeria. These are countries that America is actually coxing, you know. But it, that's, apart from the lectures that most of these countries typically say that they are getting from America, they are not getting what would actually reflect the the problem in the room. And, and so the lectures is not working for most African countries. And that is the reason why Chinese influences are, are growing and growing and growing. Apart from that also, maybe for the last point I want to say is that if you also take your mind back, the global self itself is not a monolithic, I mean, collection of, you know, there are a lot of differentiations. However, if you think of them as a collective, I mean, 1990, the share of GDP is about like 19.2%. Fast forward to 2002, the same group has actually gotten a GDP of roughly about like 42.2. I mean, their contribution, you know, China, India, and the like, I mean, have actually had a huge resurgence. And so uh, you find that, and you also find things like the BRICS and all those things. And in terms of geopolitics, this is also impacting um, AI. Now, the how is it impacting AI? It's impacting AI in the sense that these countries, I mean, um, America and, um, and China, are both exporting products to African countries. And depending on which country has, um, how do you call it, with, um, a resurgence or has a better um, foothold on the continent, you are seeing the adoption of most of its, um, uh, I would say, ideological stance or its norms and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of picture that we are um, seeing. Thank you so much. Um, and so uh, again, picking up on this kind of uh, point about capacity, uh, you know, prim uh, my work is really primarily interested in kind of tracking China's uh, really ICT footprint on the continent. And what is particularly clear is that about 70% of all ICT infrastructure on the continent is financed and built by Huawei alone. And that is precisely a point that I think was also uh, partly gestured and touched by Chico in terms of 
uh, really kind of computing capacity on the continent. And so I'd like to kind of return to them to kind of uh, further elaborate on that comment about the need for capacity building on the continent and potentially why it might be uh, a priority for African stakeholders. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really enjoying this conversation, to be honest. And so as you were speaking about the, the tension between uh, U.S., Europe and um, and China, I, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with like a, an African policymaker. And they were saying to me that, you know why we are going with China? Because Europe and the US, uh, I'm sorry for the Europe and the US people in the room and virtually, they are all about talk. The governments, they are about talk. And China, the moment you come, you, and, and this was the actual thing he said is that, the moment you start a conversation and as you're speaking, somebody in China is busy drawing out the papers. And by the time you're done with the meeting, there is a paper to be signed and there is a ship coming from China with your equipment. And I thought to myself, oh, so it's the action and the actual tangibility of promises that is actually making many of the African policymakers go, go east rather than west. Um, so so that, that's an aside. Yeah, so go, going back to our conversation around infrastructure. So the, I've been having conversations. I was uh, speaking to the to the EU uh, team and, and they were asking around, they were asking questions around sovereignty and especially AI sovereignty. And you think about it, what is AI sovereignty? It's both uh, the sovereignty of our data, but also the sovereignty of the technology that we use to host the data and to pipe and the pipelines that the pipes that are passing the data. So basically it's the hardware part of it and the data part of it, right? And the talent part of it. So when you look at it from that point of view, you realize Africa has no sovereignty to have a con conversation around, right? Because our hardware, as we've just mentioned, is either owned by the Chinese or Cisco, right? It's either Huawei or Cisco in every single office that you go uh, that is running our hardware. Who is running our fiber? Every fiber is um is owned. Most of the fiber, apart from teams maybe in Kenya and some others in West Africa, most of it is owned by a consortia of private sector uh, uh, players, which is amazing, which means we have, we have, we have connectivity. And Talent, uh, there's a paper that was released maybe three weeks ago, uh, four, no, four, that was in mid-March, that was showing that uh, the, the spread of AI talent and uh across the world and Africa was like a big gray mass in the middle of the globe. So basically we didn't have any talent that was coming out of the continent. So when you think about that and you think you come back and ask why do we have this kind of outlook is we have no infrastructure to support any type of AI work. Yeah, the one supercomputer in Morocco, there's quite there's a number of researchers that have, have been seen in, in in there. But many of the great researchers and engineers, they want to be able to work on something important on the continent, but they don't have the the room, not the, the foundational um infrastructure to be able to work on. Yes, we can use cloud computing. And I've spoken to AWS, Google, and Microsoft and say, oh, we can use uh, cloud computing to do this. That's great. But what 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 happens sovereignty and owning our own data? And most of the engineers that you speak to, they're saying, yes, I can do this, but is it big enough? We don't have that and we need to work on that. So coming back to actionable points is how do we start investing in this type of infrastructure. Private sector is doing a great job in cabling the, the continent. I mean, I have to applaud the, the, the cabling and the broadband. In the next five years, we should be able to be past 60% connectivity rate. I'm that optimistic. But setting up a compute um, ecosystem is hard and expensive. And, and when you think about it, it cannot be owned by a single African country, why? Because we have other priorities. And every time I speak to governments, they have other priorities. There are people who are dying of hunger. Uh, there are people who they want, the healthcare needs to be updated systems. There are education budgets that need to be covered. So they're not going to be investing most of their dollars on, um, on, on, on infrastructure. So how do you do is we leverage what we have. So for example, in, our, in Kenya, we have the greenest, greenest energy in the world. Guaranteed 98% of our energy is renewable. How do we then partner with people in the, with companies, governments in the West to be able to invest some of their compute to be based out of say Kenya. And in, in that, it, 
then we are sharing that with the rest of the world. We are saying some of that compute you can use on the continent, but most of it will be used by everyone else. You meet your green, uh, green energy KPIs, we get to get researchers and create jobs on the continent. Those are some of the things that we are thinking about. And that, those are some of the things that we are pushing for is come and invest in what is is right on the continent, what you can leverage on, on the continent, what the continent can offer. And Nigeria already mentioned, we have the most untapped data sets in the world, but also we have the most untapped energy in the world and it's green. I, I have to emphasize that it's green. We have the most sunshine, sunshine in the world. So that that for me would be on the infrastructure part is we have to invest in it. It has to, it can be shared, it can be secondhand. One of the key conversations we've been having here in Nigeria is how do we start tapping into the two, three year old, five year old compute systems that are not, not that useful for open AI or others uh, to be sent to Africa on our green soil and be used by our researchers to be able to build. We are going, we are willing to be more, uh, what is it called? Uh, to be more pragmatic in how we are solving for infrastructure than just going in the same way that the rest of the world has been doing. We are not going to go, go into the waiting list for NVIDIA for those GPUs. We can reuse what everybody else has been, has is throwing away. Thank you. Great, great, thank you so much. And, and so, uh, I would like uh, for Nigeria also to kind of jump on uh, on this point about effectively the digital divide um, and how to think at least from the vantage point of Africa in terms of ameliorating that uh, that I guess let's call it a long tradition that was established at the colonial encounter, uh, but also to kind of uh, maybe say a bit about how regional bodies in the context of say Africa can also participate. In, in in that kind of change that we're looking for? Yeah, in part for the continent trying to do many things at once, build a regional continental level kind of uh, infrastructure in the digital and analog era where you have the African Union acting on behalf of the continent, for example. Uh, we have a long ways to go with that, but we are building that while trying to figure out what these technologies and their rapid rate of diffusion mean for the continent. Um, and so one of the most interesting ideas that has emerged in the last 20 years or so was the idea of leapfrogging. Um, and it has its advantages where there have been opportunities for uh, the continent to bypass legacy infrastructure, but it has its limits. All too often, a lot of development uh, investments and resources went into this big idea that you can just go from zero to 100 uh, by bypassing stuff. So we ended up with ridiculous situations where you have um, tablets, education tablets in places that don't have classrooms or internet or electricity, for example. So there are all these concepts and ideas we've learned, especially in the last two decades, so, so to speak, of digitalization that need to be sort of taken in context and within the continent to say, here's what we can work with to the point that Shiko was making about, in a sense, remixing uh, and repairing using you know instruments that are being uh, written out of some sort of obsolescence. Not to say that we should always be on the obsolescent side of things, but we can start using those to our advantage and building on a culture that already exists in our economies anyway. So a lot of work also on our side to get our policy making, especially in the digital era, to think continental, even as we are a play locally. For Kenya, for example, with leveraging the green energy we have, it cannot just be to say we want to hoard all this, the resources or investments that will come to the continent. How do you share and what would sharing look like? And how do you play to the strengths of a regional partner or another partner in the West, North, South, and so on? So there's a lot of work on that level. But for that to happen, to be honest, we also need all these geopolitical contenders to understand the continent and leave give some room for that to happen. If everybody's trying to um, influence you to be in there to be fashioned in their image and um, you're left you know sort of holding placards on the outside saying but what about us and then you know you you you're sort of sidestepped when the investments or money come in so that kind of thinking and re rehabilitating how we think about Africa collectively is very very urgent in as, as we talk in as much as we talk about hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure what we think about the continent and its place and its people and what they deserve uh, is as much a political question as it is a technological one so right now the digital divide as exists whether it's an access divide a skills divide or any other divide is not so much a function of not knowing it's a function of political will to actually do what works to bypass the short you know the shiny idea that comes up every five business days somebody else comes up with a new thing I work with what's tried and tested to build infrastructure that lasts because those who are unconnected right now are sitting at the intersections of inequalities 
So if they have not gotten access, it's also because they have not received energy. Education has probably not arrived there. So when you say you're going to work for that last mile, so to speak, there's a different kind of thinking you need to work and prevailing market models or development models may not work. So you need a kind of patient capital you need from all actors to actually make this work. So at this point, it's not a lack of ideas. It's actually the will to make them work. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and so kind of turning uh, to you, uh, Jose, uh, could you then speak to this kind of point about effectively what can say maybe Western, maybe European stakeholders do in supporting say regional bodies like the AU or domestic uh, stakeholders to further, you know, uh, push their own domestic interests, specifically in terms of kind of building out capacity Okay, so that's a very, that's a great point. But however, I mean, I, I'm not a believer in um, what um, the uh, West can be doing for Africa. I have to state that at the beginning. So I think that Africa should be doing a lot for itself. And um, it has been doing so, however incrementally it is doing it, you know. So that is something that African Union should rather be pushing and then looking for partners to support. I mean, they are, so, I, I mean, they are one, multilateral ways of supporting yourself. I mean, there's the World Bank, there's the Africa Development Bank, there are um, Africa First, there's, um, um, what's it called, it's, um, Africa Smart. There are, there are various initiatives that African governments should be looking at. That's something, that is a primary point. Every continent, every country must do that for, that, for itself. And so the model that what can the Europe or what can America do, or what can China do, is, a, is an unsustainable model. And I sincerely believe that, yes, uh, we have to look inside. And the other issue that we have to also look at, you, I gave a statistic which I think startles the world. I mean, from 1990 to 2002, you've moved from 19, the global south, to about 40 plus, 42 percent, you understand, I mean, uh, in terms of your contributions to or GDP and the like. Now, there, there, there's something that comes with it. So we should be looking at South-South cooperation. We should be looking at the global South itself, which Africa is part, should be looking intrinsically at its cooperation with themselves, with India, with China, with Brazil, and so on and so forth. So forth. South Africa, with Ghana, and Ghana, with Kenya, and things like that. I've been to Kenya many times, and most of our solutions that we have had are approximate to the things which um, the condition, approximate conditions that exist, you know, both ways. And I think that South-South cooperation is a very important thing that we have to look at. The other issue that I think we need to also look at is the issue of capacity building. We have to build capacity. We have to build it. I was in Israel, I think, about three years ago, and the Israeli Prime Minister said something. He said, look, 10 years ago, or, you know, between 10, a, a decade, 10 years and 12 years, Israel was almost nothing. Israel was almost nothing. But a vision that was set before that 10 to 11 years has actually seen Israel become um, a cyber superpower. And that is the same model China has to dream something. Africa has to dream something. So we, instead of looking at what America can do or what Europe, and in any case, I mean, sorry, but. The, the, the geopolitics is showing us also that there is a decline. I mean, uh, we're approaching a certain decline in certain regions of the world. And uh, we should not therefore expect that I mean, those circumstances would um, lead to um, those countries, I mean, benevolently supporting Africa for, uh, for that sake. So there's a geopolitical underlining uh, substructure to all this thing, and it's very important that we factor that into our discussion. And whilst also I heard um, Nigeria talk, there's something that I noted, local indigenous um, innovation, whether it's in, in um, Kenya, or whether it's in Niger, where, for example, they are using uh, Bambara language to, uh, using AI to support education in their own dialect, because this is you can easily translate your country's, your, your, your native language into um, 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 a, a flurry of um, whether it's textbooks or, uh, I mean, so many things for educational purposes. 
And given those kinds of opportunities, Africa be, should be seizing, the, the opportunities are, are there, and we should be encouraging that kind of thing. So um, I keep emphasizing that we are at a crossroad, and that, that crossroad is important for Africa to um, smell the coffee and begin to help itself. No one, I mean, and uh, the notion that another, somebody will benevolently do that, it's actually not going to happen. It has never really happened. You heard some time ago, I think, Mbisi Moyo wrote a book about dead aid. And it is really true that most of the, I remember, for example, we were doing a project. I mean, I would even name the country. And they were providing support. And much as it supports and helps and gives clarity to what African countries should do, if you don't take care, it also creates a sense of dependency and despotency, you understand, and they don't do much for themselves. So it's important that um, the categorical truth be said that you have to build on something. What is Africa doing? So if you pick, for example, you can do these things without, um, you can be building infrastructure and things like that. But there are a lot of problems that are also in this area. One of them has to do with things like bias, AI, the AI that we have that does not recognize even certain people sometimes. Um, you have inequities that have to be considered. You have Africa's data um, uh, sets residing and outside the continent itself. And these are important issues because it has to do with proprietary ownership. How can you be building something if you have no access to it and it resides outside your home? Meanwhile, it's coming from your home, but yet somebody else has it. And so the legal issue has to be sorted out. The African Union, for example, rightly in 2022, has focused rightly on that aspect and has come out with the white paper on it's a policy paper on AI, supposed to be ratified by heads of state perhaps next year. And if that is it, I mean, Afghan countries, a lot of them are supposed to pick a cue from it. They prioritize the issue of the legal infrastructure. If you don't get the legal infrastructure away, then a lot of people will come and take things from your country, and there will be no law to actually stop them. By the time you wake up and open your eyes, you will see what has happened with mining in many parts of Africa with also resources in the nature of I mean, digital assets that you have for your country. So we have to get that what right. If you look at the countries, a number of countries, I mean, pick Mauritius, you pick Rwanda, you pick Egypt, Sierra Leone, Senegal, and some other countries, I mean, are working busily on getting it right, AI policies, getting them in place. That is a good thing doing things for yourself. That's something that countries in Africa should be doing. And so on the legal aspect, I think that um, we, we have to get it right so that we are able to own our data, so that we're able to use law to create, to incentivize investment and protect investment and protect IP and all those kinds of things that are the result or the fruits of AI. Because who would invest in something into which they realize that they do not have a much proprietary ownership and things like that. And that perhaps the last point that I want to raise is something which um, recently has come up. So there's a lot of exploitation of workers, for example, who are working in this field. And some of them are in Africa. A lot of them are, you know, so talking about using data sets to, um, to build AI frames. There is a problem with um, how um, labor is remunerated on the continent. And if you go to Kenya, um, you would find that as we speak, this is a big issue over there. It's all over, I mean, and, you know, and it's not something that one would want to. So these are, they are, they are issues that are uh, subsisting, and these are issues that we have to really attend. Great. Thank you so much. And so I'm now going to open the last five minutes to questions here in person, but also on the chat. So if you have a question in the audience in person first, uh, you know, please raise your hand and somebody with the mic will come to you. Uh, and then we can then quickly kind of go to the chat for the last five minutes. Hi, Karen Feinberg, an alum of uh, the a graduate school of education at Harvard. And uh, I run an impact driven innovation growth strategy consultancy. And I'm local in my work, local to global. 
Um, years ago, there was an initiative at the Calvert Foundation, and it was a diaspora impact investing initiative, um, working on infrastructure projects across sectors and issues. Um, it moved to the State Department, it kind of disappeared. I'm starting to investigate very, very loosely with some bankers um, around, and I work in the innovation ecosystem as well, thinking about the power of diaspora communities. Um, I asked some people at the World Bank recently if it's realistic uh, to have diasporas focused on infrastructure project. They kind of said no, but I just wonder out loud to you all about leveraging the skills um, and the, the money um, in diaspora communities and how can you leverage the diaspora communities to invest in the needs of the continent. I have so many other questions, but I'll just leave it at that for now. We'll take two questions, and then we'll leave it up to the panel to, uh, you know, uh, speak to whatever point they wish to speak to. Thank you so much, Giuliani. This is a great idea. So really excited to um, watch it um, come to fruition. And to all of our panelists, thank you so much for being here. Um, Nanjira and Shiko. Am I pronouncing your name correct? I do not want to make the same mistake <laughs> he did. I'm so glad. Okay. So, <laughs> so first, I am very excited about um, the work that you both are doing on the continent and with the continent. Um, and I want to just say thank you um, for the clarity of vision, for the courage to confront um, the hard realities on the ground, um, and not losing focus, which is something that happens so easily when you're in the battle for a long time. And Osei, I want to include you on that work as well. There are just four things that I want to put on the table because you are the sort of, I view you as the next generation of kind of pioneers working in the tech space. Um, 30 years ago when I started doing IP work, there was not a single IP lawyer on the African continent. Um, and so to have this robust group of folks doing this work, I think we should recognize that we have already come a long way. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. But there's a long way to go. I think Nanjira made that point, and um, this is really true. So there are four things that I'm hoping to just put on the table um, that, that should hopefully kind of help us think even harder about some of these problems. The first is, a lot of the data that we're getting about Africa um, is often not from Africa in any representative manner. And so I want to urge that as you all do this work, that that always be sort of like background music. Um, because one of the challenges that we face in trying to address um, the implications of AI in the Global South is the data that we have about the Global South is itself tainted. And so there's a lot of work to sort of think through how we verify that data, how we insist on transparency. We're, leave them alone, Chico, leave them alone. <laughs> um, um, you know, how we, how we, um, my vote, my vote is for him to stay on. Just, <laughs> it's a democracy, mom. Um, so how we, you know, how we think about transparency and insistence on understanding where the data that trained the AI that is being deployed in Africa is coming from. I think that this is a non-negotiable point. Um, just because on the accuracy alone, we need to be concerned about it. Second thing that I want to um, point out, um, much of the first wave of um, AI systems that were deployed, we know now were, were, were trained on pirated data, you know. Um, and I wonder, we have not resolved that issue in the US or in the EU, and no one's sort of touching it because it's sort of the elephant in the room. But we know that, you know, including chat GPT, we know that, you know, there were pirated data sets and, you know, people just use them to train the, 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 um, um, the, um, the AI system. So I'm curious about the extent to which pirated data could be a source of um, 
sort of lab testing for the continent. Um, I wouldn't want to encourage anything that would use pirated data as sort of the ultimate training set, but for purposes of experimentation and development and skills training, I'm curious about that because at the moment, most African AI developers or would-be AI developers have no data to your point. And if the only way to get the data is to buy it, then we're going to be in the exact same position we were in, you know, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, with all other forms of technology essentially being priced out. So I'm very, I'm very curious about what you might think um, in terms of use, using pirated data sets to help with the catch up and with the training and the development. Third um, thing that I wanted to raise has to do with um, the rural urban divide. Even with what we're seeing on the African continent, the vast majority of Africans are still in rural areas. And this has always been a problem that has troubled me. This is an infrastructure problem. It's an education problem. It's a labor problem. It's a transportation problem. It's always troubled me. Um, and so I'm curious about ways to begin to address development in the rural parts of Africa in particular, where if we think the urban centers like Abuja or Nairobi or you know, Joburg or Cape Town, if we're behind, then we're talking light years behind for rural communities. And the vast majority of Africans are still um, in the rural areas. So that's a concern and a divide that I'm curious about how we meet up. And then Osei said something lastly about uh, consulting within ourselves. And I'm just wondering whether either Berkman Klein, where we have an AI in Africa initiative, or some other uh, you know, platform that we coordinate can help facilitate the intra-African AI conversation, particularly around policy. Because when I speak to you know, offices of presidents or prime ministers, all I get is a blank stare. They're like, well, we don't know who's dealing with this. Um, so the reality is that sometimes it's not because African leaders are saying yes to China or to EU, or to, it's it's essentially a default. Nothing else is happening. No one else is paying attention to it, and these other jurisdictions see the gap and they jump in. There's almost no resistance to you know you know GIZ or um, the European Development Bank or any of these other folks coming into Africa. Um, and the reason there's no resistance is because there's you know people are occupied with trying to feed people, trying to deal with one crisis after another. No one is really sort of prioritizing AI as as urgent as it is. It is not a priority for many for, for any policy leaders. So I'm just wondering what we can do to help begin to facilitate and to kind of raise the level of urgency so that we are getting more attention to this problem than is currently the case. Thank you again so much. So any of you can just jump in wherever you, uh, you feel most inclined. Okay, I will start with jumping in, in the last for the last point that was made and the first one that was made. Um, so, and then I'll let Nanjira, I'm sure she, she has answers of the others, so I'll just give her opportunity to do that. So, so I'm going to do a plug right now. So next week on Monday and Tuesday in Nairobi, we are going to be bringing in uh, ministers of ICTs from across the continent for a conversation around AI and the GCP, uh, the Global um, Digital Compact, the GDC. And the goal of this is to have us conversations within ourselves is what is an African voice when it comes to AI and GDC. Because as Nigeria has mentioned and as Osei has mentioned, people have prescribed what the African voice is. And I mean, I think Melani will, will, uh, will, 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 will remember some of the conversations, the rooms we've been together, where everybody's saying, you know, Africa should be doing this, Africa should be doing this. And I'm thinking, whose Africa are we talking about? <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> And, and I'm learning, you remember, I was upset in one of those conversations and I was like, uh -uh, we are going to just start writing because if I talk, it will get lost in this room. I'll just start writing my thoughts out. And, and so for us now, it's 
just not putting out white papers and policy policy things. I had to remove my product heart, and I'll come to that in answering one of the questions, and start thinking about how do we start getting on an African voice. And we've been very, I mean, privileged and lucky enough to be able to have an opportunity to bring these African ministers in a room. Uh, together with big tech, our development partners, AI experts from across Africa to have a conversation on what is an African voice when it comes to AI and what is an African voice when it comes to the GDC. So yes, so the commission is happening. You're welcome. If you want to come to Nairobi, I'm sure there are flights. Uh, you can, you're welcome to come. Uh -huh. If you know of somebody who wants to come, please ping them, ping me. And I will make sure that you're in the room because this is a question that this is the first of many. I'm excited because of the excitement about these types of conversation. And I'm very grateful for the Kenyan government for helping us convene that. And number one, so I'm going back to the first question. And the first question was using diaspora as funders. So one of the key things uh, we've been doing the last um, year or so is engaging the African diaspora on how do we get uh, their voices back home. And I'll, I'll talk like an African for the next two seconds. When in Africa, they say a prophet is never uh, listened to in their own home, right? So if I'm speaking to my, to the Kenyan government, they likely not listen to me because she, she call, she's whose daughter? And they will just be asking questions around where my, my <laughs> who, who knew me? I Oh, you, I saw you growing up, all those things. You, you know those things, right? But if you bring somebody who is a, looks like you but differentiated they actually listen to them so if i bring a nigerian into kenya and an ai expert they'll be listened to by our government and said oh maybe she could have a point you know right and so mm -hmm. we're talking to like different think tanks the african uh think tank uh persons like uh nigeria people who work for the think tanks to start having an african voice from a think tank perspective but also we are talking to our huge diaspora we know that our diaspora is the biggest foreign direct investor on the continent. Not anybody else, not the US government, not the Chinese government, but our diaspora remits the most money. So we are tapping into them on two levels. First of all, A, please continue sending your money, don't stop. Number two is, uh, <laughs> number two is start sending us your, your knowledge and your insights and your pointers. Let's pick your point. So I'll not mention their names. We are working with a, one of the leading minds in uh, computer and GPU has worked with NVIDIA and others from the African continent to help put a strategy on how do we put like uh, GPUs on the continent. We are working with like the, one of the biggest, um, one of the, on some of the senior most uh, executives in, te in tech companies from Africa on how do we start encouraging talent to to support 10% or with 10% of their time to start working on African issues. So we are doing that by tapping into that diaspora network. So if you know any African executive who wants to invest back on the continent, please ping me. Thank you very much. And going back to the question around uh, piloted data. So my other heart is we are building stuff. You're not just talking, we are also building stuff. My team is also building stuff. And one of the, the key things we've been saying is how do we build data sets that are authentic on the continent? So number one is having a bunch of young people recording data manually, which is super interesting. And so that's one way of doing it. So we there's a, there's a piece of work on health that we are using, like a bunch of hundreds of young people going out with recorders and data collectors and just collecting data. And so we are going to be building that. Number two is using Sheng language. The good thing is every podcaster who speaks in one of the languages that we are using, every radio station, every somebody who is recording anything, they're enthusiastic to actually give us the data. So data has stopped being a problem because we are telling them we want to build this for ourselves. And that is our pitch to them is you're building this for ourselves. So we don't have to use pirated data. We, we can actually, sorry, um, I've gone dark a bit, uh, I'll continue. We can actually get data and people are willing to give without us being using illegal data because again it will be an, a, a huge backlash to us because we know better so i just wanted to mention on those three things and i'll leave the rest of the panel to speak on the on the others thank you real quickly i'll give a shout to the questions there have been excellent questions in the chat and they have been pointed out to have been overlooked so i've tried to answer some of them and i hope zahra Nai and uh, Badria, you feel like at least some some response and some anonymous actors. And I, I think it's illustrative of something we see often when the diaspora conversation comes in, the flip side of it, where there's some, some subtle hierarchies are introduced um, about who's a better African to speak to some issues than others. And we must be very mindful of that. 
um, in the idea of who can then represent the continent in what aspects and where. Um, and especially the idea of maybe them having more talent or more, uh, more to offer these topics. I think there's uh, overall, um, anyone who's really interested in working on sustained and lasting solutions for the continent needs to really come at it with a humble, uh, humble stance that really thinks of these things in the relationality aspect. My knowledge and my expertise may be very, may be platformed in one way, but does not make it a truth all throughout. I must really see it in context. This is very important. And I think with AI specifically, to one question that has already been asked uh, severally in the in the chat is the whole idea of it becoming a priority right now. There's a real risk of this contagion making it seem like everything else we've been doing, say in health sector, in education, in other agriculture, I usually speak to those big three, have not been doing it and AI is the solution. There's a new wave of techno solutionism that is coming in that we must be very mindful of because at the end of the day, um, what we need, what we are seeing is when solutions are brought to the last mile. So somebody builds an LLM solution for farmers to just, you know, input what's the problem with their crops and get answers. The explainability aspect is very important to them. And if you have built a solution that was built in Harvard and does not have any element of explainability all the way to the end product, um, it creates this untrustworthy dynamic. And these are very important aspects. In as much as we rely more on technology, that relationality aspect is very important. There's a very good example as well of AI very rightfully being used in helping image uh, in imaging of uh, pregnancy stages. But the, the techs that were using this uh, in the clinical offices in, in rural parts of the continent could not explain what's happening. And so if you've not empowered, so to speak, the person who's supposed to use the technology, if they're not involved in the design or in understanding the technology that they're supposed to use in service to a healthcare or agriculture or any other aspect, I don't know that we have done ourselves any justice in helping these tools work for us. And so that's an aspect of techno solutionism we have to be very mindful of. I'll also very speak, quickly speak to the idea of uh, representative African data and the question of where it's supposed to be represented, because I think a fundamental political question is, is it justice to be included in fundamentally unjust systems? Is it more if now more of our data is grabbed and brought into extractive systems that have fed the globalization that we are living through today, is that justice to the African ecosystem? This is a really important question. It's not to say, you know, slow down, we're being Luddites and let's not build. It's saying we need to situate these things and asking ourselves, at the end of the day, once we have drawn everything out from Africa, where will Africa be? This is an urgent political question that we must ask ourselves both at home and abroad. So that we're not perpetuating the same models that have not offered the dividends that we have expected from all the expertise that has come from yonder about what should happen on the continent. So I just wanted to bring in the flavor of how much these questions at the end of the day are also deeply political um, that have to be answered in places like Connected next week, where I personally plan to ask some very tough questions. And in rooms like this, when we're thinking about ideas for what Africa should be uh, and the solutions we're thinking we should um, inject into the very complex ecosystem that it is. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So maybe what I want to do is to, to, to speak to the last question. And I think that how do you call it? Um, um, it's really important to say that for the Africa continent today, a lot of the diaspora influences and of course the diaspora contributions are very much welcome in many states. I mean, particularly if you're looking at maybe countries like you know, Morocco, Nigeria, and Kenya. And then also the pack leader of it all, my own country, Ghana. So we have a policy, and the policy that we have uh, filters into so many programs that we do in our country. The year of the return, for example, in which um, diaspora um, members, I mean, from oh, the Caribbean, America, Europe, whatever, are very much welcome in Ghana. In fact, they even get citizenship in Ghana if they are interested. And so it's been part of the continental project or has been part of the um, Africa we want kind of project for Ghana, the integration project. And AI is included in that project because it comes within the sector of technology. And so Ghana stands at a very, I mean, like a four lead when it comes to that area. Areas where you can engage, for instance, I mean, and that, these are areas where Ghana prioritizes, uh, areas to do with policy frameworks. And these are areas where, I mean, um, you are able to input and able to support and able to bring on different perspectives that are useful. It's, that is allied to issues to do with capacity building. You know, and Ghana prides itself as a back leader when it comes to 
regional um, um, diplomacy with other African countries, if it's, whether it's to do with cyber diplomacy or to do with AI diplomacy or whatever, I mean, this is an area where you can believe that Ghana would be very supportive of. How do you um, engineer these things or how do you get these things across? So one, one, one clear area, it's the educational sector. So there are institutions in Ghana that are focused on evolving technologies and are very much interested in this. They, are, they offer one route. The others have to do with the policy sector, the ministers and the like. And it's important that they are included in the kind of I mean, uh, policy discussions that are done with education institutions on the continent. So they, and Ghana has a convening power and is able to bring. But then also, one of the things that is also occurring is that apart from legislation that is happening a bit fast on the continent, you are also seeing the setup of um, expert, expert groupings at the top level of most countries. So most countries, I mentioned about five countries that, for example, have actually come out already with um, AI strategies. But then you also have about like 15 other countries that are tinkering with it. And so the, it's, um, th this collaborative agenda um, is something that is very much welcome, particularly by these kind of communities that are popping up and emerging. And I think that, I mean, if there is any a proposal or a suggestion to any of the, I mean, the countries I've mentioned here, they will very much welcome it. And that becomes, uh, we, have, we have congregated on a program, of course, of deep importance to Africa because of uh, two things. One, economic issues. I mean, there's a, a paper out there that says that uh, Nigeria, Ghana, um, Morocco, and um, South Africa if they were to harness the power of AI by 2030, they should be raking in over 130 billion, you know. And this is because there's so much unexplored areas within the African continent that can, AI can make a big difference. And so there's a big interest, I can see, there's a big interest in Africa about this. And I keep emphasizing that if you are really set and you make some proposals, firm proposals, it will be met with that. You can also look at the African Union itself, so that because the African Union is um, accelerating its um, um, expertise groups on the continent. I mean, it's come up with a policy framework. The African Union has got an Africa um, EU digital strategy, and that is something that you can support, and that's an entry point, you know. So these type of partnerships um, can actually really, really help, and they will be very much welcome. Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, to our panel uh, for a very kind of interesting and insightful conversation. Uh, and again, this panel is not like a single event, but it's really uh, the start of a hopefully a very long conversation that we'll be having both, you know, at Georgetown and beyond Georgetown. And in particular, trying to somewhat situate AI, not in an, any abstract sense, but or situate AI within kind of say technical fetishes in which we presume that our political and perennially long challenges are gonna, you know, whiff away as soon as we kind of adopt AI. But rather, as many of the panelists have been suggesting, is that like uh, we can kind of work along with AI and AI regulators to try and create more inclusive futures. And so with that, you know, we'll love to thank you for your attendance and uh, would love to thank the panel for their insights. <laughs> you too. <laughs> wow. A lot. <laughs> Wonderful moderation. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah.